Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. Today's episode of Friday Morning Ramblings is all about managing down disease, diseases and pests. And happy Mother's Day. This is the right Sunday. So we're going to walk through the garden. I'm going to show you some of what I do to manage the pests and disease. But it's really important that you sit down and think about when problems show up in your garden. If you don't have a journal, I recommend getting a journal. I do sell them at my seed shop. And the whole idea is to write down the date that problems appear, be it birds, snails, pests, diseases, powdery mildew, whatever. Write the date down when you first notice them. And you really want to start preventing, you really want to start preventative spraying for diseases like that two weeks early before they show up. You get the stuff on the plants, stops the disease from getting hold, can prevent the powdery mildew from getting so bad. I also know that I get birds, for instance, coming in and eating down or eating the blueberries before they're ripe, before I can even harvest them. So I do have to go to bird netting now because a group of birds found these last year and they come back, now they'll come back every year. So you can use bird netting. It's really, really fine. This is a 14 by 14 foot piece of bird netting. And what I recommend is getting a staple gun, just like this, some aluminum foil that you're going to tag onto the netting so that the birds can see a little bit better that there might be something here. Because birds will get tangled in there, but that's, that just is, is what happens. So I use some garden stakes and I just nail down about every foot the bird netting. I'm going to only keep this on the plants, you know, while the blueberries ripen until I harvest them. And then I'm going to be pulling the netting off of this, folding it up and putting it away. If this was going to be more permanent, I would put down like a heavy piece of canvas or something over the netting and then staple through the canvas into the netting, into the board, and that will be more permanent. And that's something that just will be more sturdy. But with a 14 foot square piece, you want to leave a couple of feet at the end that's not attached to, to, the, uh, to the stake so that you can fold it over and close off the end. And I hope you know that makes sense. But I'm going to have to do this or I'm going to lose all of these beautiful blueberries because the birds are going to come in before I would even eat them and take them all. And then just hang bits of foil around so maybe they see this netting and you don't have any problems with the birds. So that's one thing. And the whole key that a lot of my tomatoes and I showed you last week, I've even put in more, but everything is going to go out this week. We had a lot of rain this weekend. That's why that video is late and I didn't get everything into the ground, but the whole summer garden is going in. The whole key to managing pests and disease is to not think you have to be perfect and stop them all. You want to just stop them all 100%. You just want to manage them down so you get limited damage and you get maximum production. And the only way that you can really keep track of all this is to write it down, start taking notes. If it's your first year, that's fine, you know. You're going to see stuff come up. If you want to talk to fellow gardeners, um, maybe some quality nurseries, they can tell you when the diseases show up. Now. As we walk around, you can see lots of stuff growing. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. I want to dispel a couple of myths. First of all, some gardeners will say, well, if you have got great soil and great soil biology, then your plants are healthy. They won't get pests or disease. That's false. It's a lie. If you have weak soil, they're not being fed well. The plants are weaker. They're more susceptible. Maybe they show the disease more. Maybe the pests do more damage, but you don't fail your plants because you did something wrong with the soil. If that were true, in places where they have great soil and stuff, pests and disease wouldn't show up because the plants would be too strong to deal with them. You do want to keep the plant healthy so they can best fight off the diseases, but diseases have evolved over millions of years. So they are just looking for a couple of things. Usually it's humidity, the right humidity, the right temperature, and then they show up on the leaves, they reproduce and they do their thing. So healthy soil helps, but it's not, you, you don't get those diseases in your garden, those pests in your garden because you did something wrong is my point. The other myth is that you cause diseases because you've watered and wet the plant leaves. And that doesn't make sense for one simple reason. How do rains in nature, how do rains, I gave it away, how do plants 
in nature get watered from rain. Rain is always soaking and wetting down the leaves. So there is some truth to it, but let's go with what's not truth. When you have cucumber plants and you have zucchini plants all over the place, you see powdery mildew come in and then people will tell you, you you're causing a problem by wetting the leaves. Actually powdery mildew, the spread of it is inhibited by actual water being on there. They like humidity, not water sitting on there. So in that case, it's totally not true. Now, if you have a specific plant and a specific disease, maybe some over the top watering, wetting the leaves, perpetuates the disease more quickly. However, it doesn't bring it on. It's not the cause of it. So if you see diseases pop up and it's on your leaves, well, maybe that's when you decide, I'm not gonna water and soak the leaves because you have a disease problem going on. So that's when you would water underneath. But you don't have to fear you can't wet your leaves because it's going to cause disease. That's just not true. And if you do have a problem on your leaves, stop watering from the top and wetting them down and just water the earth until the disease is under control. So last week I showed you the holes in here and again I'm going to talk about what you can use. I'm not giving you the formulas. You can look up some things on my channel if you want to find more about the formulas. But I just want to go over what works. So usually when you have bigger holes like this it's snails and slugs. You can pick up the uh, baited slug baits. They're usually baited uh, with iron phosphate or sulfur. You just scatter them around nicely, broadly, don't clump them. Snails will eat them, slugs will eat them, and they'll die off. And you want to start that again a couple weeks early. As the temperatures start warming up, put that bait out when you don't have much growing will kill off a lot of those pests. As you start seeing problems, that means probably you waited too long. Put it out again, we'll kill them off. This will be perfectly fine. Now, also, you may get the green cabbage worm or other caterpillars on here. There's no flowers on here, so this is where I would use a dust. That will kill them. Or I might use neem oil, that works. Or I might use a product called BT, which is also organic. That would work too. There's a lot of dust that are organic. But remember, dust, organic or not, synthetic, chemical, human-made, organic, any kind of insect dust will kill most, if not all, insects that contact it. So it's not like you get organic dust. It only kills the bad insects. It could kill the pollinators and the bees. But there's no flowers or anything on these plants, so this might be a place that I use dust. And then when you're doing your sprays or your dusts, start early, as I mentioned, two weeks, and then maybe every 10 days, every 14 days for prevention. If you have an outbreak, then maybe you want to treat every three days or once a week, whatever cycle works. Carrots, celery, there will be I'm trying to think, probably the monarch likes to lay their eggs in carrots, um, parsley, dill. You might want to keep those. So you also want to know what your pests are, what your diseases are. Um, <laughs> most diseases aren't friendly. But some things, some caterpillars you might want to keep because you want to, you know, have the uh, butterfly population expand. Things are going really well in here. The peas need to be trellised. I'll put in some stakes now. But everything is taking off because the weather is right. And I'm just looking to see. And you always want to double check. Like when I go out in water, I walk around and I look at my different plants. I don't see any caterpillars on here. I'm pretty sure this is snails and slugs. And how you know, well, okay, I'll take it back. See these tiny holes? Sometimes when the holes are really tiny, that's when the caterpillar is really small. They're eating small holes in there. When you just look at a leaf and all of a sudden it has big holes in it, that's usually a snail and a slug. But it could be a combination of both going on. Anyway, that would be a sign that you might want to put some dust down. You want to put down your um, snail and slug baits. Every garden's not going to get the same diseases. Humidity varies. Uh, temperatures vary. Diseases are pretty specific to a set of the right conditions, humidity, temperature, and then they show up. So in my area, I get leaf spot on tomatoes. I get early blight on tomatoes. I get leaf spot in different um, 
fungi on different plants but they always show up at the same time and why I can't say hey from April 15th to May 7th start spraying for this disease because the temperatures or the conditions are going to vary garden to garden they may start here in my area late April maybe in your area late May so you kind of have to keep that journal but things are looking really good I replanted in here um, some more radishes been harvesting all the lettuce giving it away now if you don't want to use any chemicals or any sprays the ag fabric works really well these are actually for trees um, it's called ag fabric and you can pull it tight right down there it's got a drawstring and it also has a zipper so this is going to keep the butterflies off my kale and collards in here and I'll be able to just come in and harvest snails and slugs might be able to get in so you sprinkle some of that uh, slug bait around here too this is a barrier a non-chemical barrier and I'm actually kind of getting used to it and I'm going to put up a couple more on my squash and zucchini when they get to size but this is a great way to have to do less work as my garden gets bigger as I expand the different gardens even though the neem oil works really well dusts work really well I want to do that less I just don't want to spend a lot of time on there I want to show you so some of the stuff that I'm pulling out of here so spinach is coming out and then just look at these this is my second wave of radishes I mean they're just awesome so I'm going to be harvesting a lot of radishes out of there here is also some of the second waves of radishes these are Roxanne's I mean look how beautiful these are these are going to be for dinner tonight I also put in my final wave of radishes over on the other side I was was telling you radishes like the cooler weather so by the end of May it's going to just be too warm the soil is going to be too warm radishes get spicier they get pithier they get woodier they flower more quickly as the warm weather comes in and I'm just gonna to have to wait till later August to start my fall plantings of these cool weather crops so another pest that I know I get are asparagus beetles so as your asparagus I've been harvesting a lot of it but as you let a lot of the spears kind of just mature they send out the really fine leaves I get asparagus beetles so I spray that down early with neem oil that works really really well turnips carrots are coming up beets are, are growing this is all going to be beans and stuff I think I was talking about that before the shard Swiss chard is going to be coming out starting to flower you can see the flowers in there but the leaves have been delicious I've been making a lot of stews everything in here looks good typically slugs and snails and bok choy or pak choy are really a plant that those slugs and snails love so a couple days ago I put down the baits they all should be fine so then I also use things like peppermint oil rosemary oil I sell that at the seed shop when I get my cucumbers in after they're growing a little bit usually spider mites come in um, when I grow beans the uh, Mexican I think it's a Mexican bean beetle shows up I found that the peppermint oil works really well on those so I have that ready to go as my plants are maturing and I just spray the undersides of my cucumber plants my bean plants that keeps those pests away and again I've learned this over years so don't feel like you have to know everything to start and I just want to show this again this is where I had the test beds I always talk about this but I'm amazed these were both planted at the same time when it was much colder and there were frosts and I had the polycarbonate over there and I just want to show you just look how much better those peas look than the peas over here everything on the right side grew quickly much more quickly and I'm harvesting it sooner than what's over here which I think is really cool other diseases that I get these are this is an apple tree with four different types of apple spliced onto one trunk they're going to start and it's starting to show up right in here about now so I'm going to get my spray out to really control the disease that forms on here and that will help these come to maturity and you can see the apples are already on there if I let this go this is just going to take this whole plant over cause some damage and you can see 
it's coming up and of course I was late on the spraying you should practice what I talk about but it's all going to come down I mean they're all going to get sprayed today or tomorrow so it's wonderful that as the temperatures warm up conditions become right your garden takes off but also that means here come the pests here come the diseases and you know they're going to affect the garden one way or another and the whole goal is you don't want to go with I need to eliminate it hundred percent if you can that's great you want to manage it down so that it doesn't really harm production these got some dust uh, last week they're just starting to flower all these holes in here were the um, flea beetle that's been taken care of using the dust when I have flowers everywhere on tomato plants I typically won't use the dust but I'm also pruning the bottom and putting a big gap between the soil and the leaves up here and sometimes that prevents the beetles from being able to get on there now don't uh, hold me to that um, the flea beetles may be able to fly I don't know if they do but there's different kinds of insects some fly in some crawl in so you can create physical barriers and that helps too you just have to figure out what works best in your garden let's go back over towards here containers are doing really well all the lettuce is going to be coming out peppers are starting to green up and you can see some holes and stuff in there I'm not just not worrying about that when these plants and here we'll go back to a, a little bit what I was saying earlier when these plants are a little bit weaker when these plants were a little bit weaker because of the frost that came in they were a little bit more susceptible to the pest coming and eating the weakened leaves now that being said it's true if your plants do get weaker they might be more susceptible to the pests and disease but I just want to be clear if you have the perfect soil the healthiest plants diseases and pests are still going to show up and that's not your fault you have to have a plan in place for prevention these are columbines and you can see all those trails on there that's the leaf miner in a lot of places and you can tell that's just kind of squiggly all over if I don't have it right maybe it's not the leaf miner I'm pretty sure it is whatever it just stays to this plant it doesn't transfer over to my tomato plants or anything like that if for some reason I see them jump from here and they're getting my dwarf tomatoes I'll start treating that I'll read up more on leaf miners figure out what spray works and take care of it that way but sometimes you don't have to worry about that specific pest or disease because it doesn't spread to the rest of your plants coming over here this is the first wave of potatoes that I put in for my you know great potato experiment and they're doing really well nice and green and you can see remnants of dust again no flowers on here I'm not worried about dusting and harming beneficial insects but I get the potato beetle other beetles come in here so I dusted I think last week or so and just want to make sure because the beetles start showing up over the next couple of weeks that I'm killing off anything that might be starting maybe every seven days 14 days put some dust down that stops uh, infestation from happening manages down the problems these will start dying off I'll be able to harvest and then a potato beetle doesn't wreck the potatoes basically coming down here I have eggplant And the eggplant is a little weak looking a little bit yellow that's because it's just not warm enough it got down to 39 degrees um, last night once it warms up this is going to take off but it did have the flea beetles on there you probably can't see it but there's a little speck at the end of my thumb that's a flea beetle there's no more holes or no more damage from last week when I put the dust down so it's working to control the flea beetles one tip I have for you is to use your phone take a picture of the plant of the leaves a week later compare those leaves to the pictures and if you see an increase in damage then your treatments not working if you don't see an increase in damage then your treatment is working and that's a good way to just make sure things are going in the direction you want to go again managing down the pest damage managing down the disease damage let's go over to a place that's not planted yet they're gonna get squash plants and I want to talk about another way to prevent pests and disease so we talked about using barriers physical barriers like the ag fabric cutting a break between the the earth and the top of the tomato plant using dusts and sprays 
The other thing that you can do, and I'm going to have cucumbers and squash and zucchini probably go in here or in some part of the garden. The vine borer moth comes at a specific time. So I can plant squash and zucchini now. It'll take off. I'll get a harvest. And then I'm not sure if it's June. I've got to check my notes. Late June or July for like a two or three week period. The vine borer moth is around laying the eggs. So I will try and fight them. I got better at it. I can really reduce the damage. I put dust on the stem, dust on the outer leaves. I don't dust around the flowers. However, the whole tr key is maybe that three week period, I just let the plants die off. I start transplants somewhere where the moth, the butterfly, whatever it is, can't get to them. When the life pattern or the seasonal pattern or that three week period of the disease where the diseases flourish is gone or when the insect uh, reproduces and lays eggs is gone, then you put your plants out and you don't even have to worry about the vine borer. So a lot of times I put another wave of the squash and zucchini out in August after the vine borer has done its thing and those plants do beautifully through August, September until the frost comes. So you can also plant around high temperatures. You can plant around when the diseases show up because the conditions are right. Like July we have more heat, more humidity or when the life cycle of the moth or the beetles or the insects or whatever are most active and they're looking to reproduce and damage your plants. And you have to, you know, keep a journal and that will allow you to figure out when are the best planting times, when to start your prevention. And I think maybe we'll leave it at that. Prevention for diseases and pests are a big deal and it's usually the last thing we learn as gardeners. But it's also the most devastating. Like you'll get everything growing, the problems come in, and then you're disappointed because they kill off your plants. That might happen if it's your first year. But take notes, try and figure out what it is, start prevention early, couple of weeks, learn how to treat them, and then you'll get better and better at it. And if your cucumbers, for instance, die out mid-July, your zucchini squash die out, they grow really fast. So just start some transplants, not in the garden, somewhere closer to the house, large containers, put them out, you know, end of July, beginning of August, and you'll still get another harvest out of them. So that's a great way to really manage down loss. You're just not planting then, and then you put in a huge wave of plants after the conditions are gone that help those, those pests and diseases thrive. Hope that makes sense. Gives you some confidence that you can manage down pests and disease, and you can really get a great production out of your garden. Thanks so much for watching. Please check out my seed shop at therustedgarden.com and I'm looking forward to getting all my summer crops in and please subscribe this is an ongoing series but also but I'm also doing a whole series on vertical gardening so I have two episodes done for that and the third one will be coming up soon again thanks for watching and have a great week oh and happy mother's day for real